Good morning. Welcome to the UNC Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Series. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this presentation. Our presenter today is Javita Newman. Javita is the Facilities Coordinator for the Health and Exercise Science Department at Wake Forest University. In addition, she is the Project Manager for the Weight Loss and Exercise for Communities with Arthritis in North Carolina, the Weekend Study, and the Osteoarthritis Prevention Study, TOPS, in the department. She has a diverse background in biomechanics, aging, and physical activity, and in arthritis. And I just want to say I've had the pleasure to work with Jovita for the last, I guess, six years now. And she is amazing and makes everything run uh, so smoothly. And we're delighted she could join us today her, with her presentation titled Recruitment in a Clinical Trial, Lessons Learned. Jovita, whenever you're ready to begin, please do. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And thank you for that introduction, Lee. Um, as uh, Lee mentioned, I work at Wake Forest University, and I also did my undergraduate work at Wake Forest University in the Department of Health and Exercise Science. Afterwards, I went to East Carolina University for graduate school and then returned back to Wake to work with Dr. Stephen Messier and I've been working there now for almost 20 years on his clinical trials. So as Lee mentioned, I'm going to be talking about recruitment. There are many reasons as to why clinical trials fail and the number one reason is recruitment and so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Recruitment begins with the announcement of the study from the study team to persons that are representative of the target population and ends with the enrollment of those who actually meet the study qualifications. On average, recruitment takes approximately 30% of the project timeline in most trials, and it's been identified as the number one reason why the clinical trials fail. Unsuccessful recruitment may lead to increased cost, it may result in a reduced sample size, which could lead to statistical implications, and it ultimately poses a threat to the successful completion of a study. And it's estimated that 56% of clinical trials are terminated prematurely due to poor recruitment. So thus, recruitment is a key determinant of success for clinical trials. 66 to 80% of all research studies fail to meet the recruitment goal. And in fact, 27 to 50% of all studies enroll none to just one research participant. Research shows that on average, only 10% of subjects actually survive the recruitment funnel. So starting with the candidates who might be interested in the clinical trial and working down to the few who actually get enrolled into the study. In order to increase that number at the bottom of the funnel, you've got to increase the number of participants at the top of the funnel by spending more money and effort at the beginning of recruitment and maximizing the impact of the time and money spent throughout that process. There are many barriers to recruitment um, and recruiting with older adults, which we typically do, can be challenging and presents additional barriers. In discussing barriers, they can be broken down into a couple different categories. There are participant or patient related barriers such as travel barriers. Um, these could be things such as distance or lack of transportation. There's a lack of time, lack of interest due to disturbances in personal or social life or an unwillingness to change your habits. And then there's also a mistrust of research. To eliminate or minimize these barriers, researchers may offer transportation or reimbursement for travel-related expenses. Researchers should also carefully assess the location of the facility as research has shown that that, that is a motivating factor in that decision-making process on whether to join a research study. Offering multiple locations within a site area would also help to make that study more accessible. For time commitment issues, offering a flexible study visit schedule, such as offering evening or weekend times if possible. And during the recruitment process, outlining the goals of the study and attracting the right participants. So those who have interests that would actually be addressed by the study will help to yield um, greater um, response to those ads. And then establishing connections and using trusted resources will help with that mistrust of research. 
There's also barriers at the site level, such as staffing and metrics and with the recruitment process. Having an adequate number of staff to fulfill the recruitment duties is important. And so I would recommend having a dedicated person or even a team that's dedicated specifically to recruitment. That re recruitment team should meet regularly. And in those meetings, they should look at the metrics. It's important to have real time tracking so that you can keep an eye on what is working. You don't wanna keep pouring money into a system or into a method that's not working. And you'll want to continuously recruit. It's easy to want to relax or slow things down when recruitment is going well, but the danger in doing that is if things do slow down too much and you need to ramp back up, it is hard to climb out of that hole. So it's important to leave yourself a cushion. With a lot of our studies um, in the past, we have had a four to six week scheduling window so that we're scheduling that far ahead so that if things do start to slow down, we've got ample time to try to get caught back up. And it's also important to have a standardized recruitment process or recruitment plan um, with realistic goals. That recruitment process should be outlined for the staff and time should be dedicated towards recruitment training. That'll all allow for a smoother process. So just in thinking back to the funnel, your enrollment is dependent on the number of persons that actually contact the study. If no one sees or hears about your study, you're not gonna get any participants. And so I'm now gonna talk about some of the different methods that we actually use to advertise our studies. Our clinical trials advertise in a variety of ways. The one we use the most often and still shows to be the most effective for us is advertising in the newspaper. In advertising, it's suggested that you follow the seven times rule, which means that a potential participant has to see your ad seven times before they would actually act on it. And so we typically spend anywhere from $300 for like a small three by three ad and up for quarter page, half page and full page ads. And we run our ads multiple times throughout the week for multiple weeks. These are just some of the sample newspaper ads that we've run at Wake Forest uh, for some of our clinical trials. We've also had a lot of success in running advertorials, which is um, the ad itself is actually written by the local newspaper staff in the form of an article. So many times when the advertorial is run, we run it along with some of our typical ads in the paper at the same time to try to garner interest in our study. <clears throat> And where we get kind of what I say the biggest bang for our buck or really lack thereof because we don't spend any money on this is when we have a newspaper reporter come out to interview our staff, investigators and participants. This creates a huge buzz for our study. Um, we typically have it in conjunction with our press release if possible. Um, so we try to do it, of course, at the beginning of the study. One thing we have found is that many times the paper is interested in reporting findings when they come out. So if it's at the beginning of a study, we don't have findings for the study, but we're able to, or we have been able to release that um, along with the release of data possibly from another study. And then if that's not possible, we've still been able to attract interest from the reporters in finding some type of special interest piece that garners their attention. So with this particular article that was written, it was for the START study, which was a strength training study, uh, intervention study in adults with knee osteoarthritis. There was a participant in the study that at the time was 94 years old. And so a reporter wanted to come out and interview him and she was able to create a story based off of that. Advertising with the newspaper doesn't only mean print advertising, there is digital advertising as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about online advertising a little later, but did just wanna mention that that's an option with newspaper advertising. This particular ad is called a pencil push down where initially just that top headline is shown when someone's on the newspaper website. And then if they click on that, the full ad will appear. The circulation of newspapers has been declining, especially with the impact of the pandemic. In 2020, the circulation of weekday newspapers was 24.3 million and 25.8 million for the Sunday paper, which was a decline of about 6% from the year before. 
1990, it was 63.2 and 62.6 million. Since 2004, it's estimated that on average, 100 newspapers are closing each year, um, creating what's called a news desert. And typically, these communities that are news deserts, which are communities that have lo no local newspaper or diminished access to the news or information, these communities tend to be older, poor, or less educated than the overall population. However, overall, 16% of adults do get their information still from print newspaper, and of those that use a print newspaper, 25% of them are over the age of 65. There's also radio and TV advertising. In Winston-Salem, the costs are about $400 and up, depending on the methodology that's used, the frequency of the ads, or the time slots that we select for these ads. This advertising has been less successful for us, and it's our belief that some of it's due to the fact that in comparison to the newspaper, with the radio or TV, you have to catch it at that specific time to see the information. So if you miss it, you lose your opportunity compared to a newspaper that may lay around all day long for someone to see. Um, one exception to that is similar to the newspaper where we had the reporter come out, we've been able to do that with the TV ads as well or with the TV reporter as well. Um, and also a lot of times when they do come out, we also get more than one slot. So they may run the news story during the five o'clock news and then again in the evening at 10 o'clock or they may do a live story where they're on site for an hour and they kind of cut in and out for that news story. And similarly to the newspaper, the TV ads do also have digital stories posted online. And so when something like this is done, the, if a person happens to frequent the news station website, they may see the story there. So next, I'm just gonna show a quick clip from one of our news um, reportings that we did. <laughs> Sages has been dealing with osteoarthritis in her knee for seven years now. It limits my mobility. It um, affects my balance. It's uh, hard for me to play with my grandchildren. Uh, She's now enrolled in a study at Wake Forest University. It's looking at ways to treat her knee pain. It's the leading cause of disability in older adults. Dr. Steve Messier has a $6 million grant to study how diet and exercise affect knee osteoarthritis. There's something magical about the combination of diet and exercise that reduces pain more than either of the interventions alone. He's looking for 820 people to join his study in Forsyth, Haywood, and Johnson counties. People over the age of 50 who are overweight or obese and have had knee and have knee pain most days of the week. The study requires an 18 month commitment. Three days a week uh, for this 18 months they can come uh, and exercise at one of the facilities within the county uh, and there'll be supervision there. And in addition to that, they'll have diet classes. Sages has had great success. She has less pain and has lost 32 pounds. It's a wonderful thing. If you're interested in the study, call 1-877-BE-VITAL to see if you qualify. Kimberly Van Scoy, WXII, 12 News. And so that's just an example of, uh, like I said, when one of the news reporters came out to do a story. And so we do get a lot of response when things like that are done, because it's not only run on the news, but then also put on their website online. And what we've also found is when something like this runs on the news, other stations become interested too. So we also get to do other um, reports and then sometimes a newspaper as well. With our latest two osteoarthritis studies, uh, the START study, which I mentioned earlier, was a strength training intervention study. And then we can, which is a diet and exercise intervention study. We had a lot of success with direct mail advertising, and there are many different types of direct mail avenues that you can use, such as penny and coupon mailers. There's some that you can purchase based on location and others where you can be more specific with your target audience. 
one of the ones we um, always use, it's a specified newspaper or newsletter that goes out to seniors in the Winston-Salem area. It's titled Volunteers in Touch with Aging and Life or the Vital Newsletter. And it goes out to 15,000 older adults within the Winston-Salem area. It goes out twice a year. Uh, many of the newsletters or many of the people that receive the newsletters are persons that were in previous research studies or they're interested in getting involved in research. And so they've signed up to get this newsletter. The newsletter highlights upcoming studies uh, like shown here on the cover, and then also allows for a placement of ads and then contains stories that may be of interest to those who wanna participate in research. The use of electronic medical records and recruitment has also been successful for us. Through our CTSI at the hospital, we can access medical records in the Wake Forest system to identify prospective subjects based on ICD codes, such as arthritis, procedural codes, such as knee injections or knee surgeries. You can also use the electronic medical records to identify people based on demographics, such as age and gender. And the records can also be used to search for persons that had recent or upcoming visits that may be of interest to the study. Once we run our queries, we then send the postcards to the names of those we've obtained. Um, similarly, studies could opt to send emails or messages within a hospital system, such as my chart or my health, informing them of active studies that they may qualify for. With the electronic medical records, we're able to narrow our potential subject pool and concentrate on those who are more likely to qualify for our study. So this is just an example of some of the postcards that we've sent out. And sending our postcards out using the electronic medical records, we have seen a benefit in that because the postcard is coming from within the health system, some participants have reported feeling more comfortable in participating or said they're more likely to participate in the studies um, in comparison to those who just randomly got a postcard in the mail. And as I mentioned earlier, emails could also be sent to potential eligible subjects through the use of electronic medical records as well. And the use of the medical records can also be helpful during the planning of recruitment. It could allow you to determine the available cohort that you might have in a specific area um, and make realistic recruitment goals. We have a pilot study that we're doing right now where we're using the electronic medical records to identify providers that see patients with a disease of interest, in this case, it's osteoarthritis, and we then plan to engage with those specific providers to assist with recruitment to the pilot. Internet usage has increased in older adults over time. In the US, it's estimated that 12% um, of adults over the age of 65 are using the internet. And that grew to 67% in 2017, and it's been going up each year. Given the um, increased usage with online um, activities, advertising online is a viable option for disseminating information about the study into the community. And we've achieved this in a number of ways. I've mentioned previously that we use the local newspaper and the TV station's web pages, but we also post information about our studies on our departmental and hospital websites. Uh, this is our hospital website, it's called Be Involved, and persons who are interested in research can go here to read about current studies that are going on. Many major hospitals and clinics have something similar to this and offer this at no cost to the studies within their systems. Additionally, um, our department has set up its own research page in which studies conducted by PIs in our department can post enrollment information and descriptions of the studies that they're doing. And so although persons that may go to the hospital website or to this departmental website are people who are actively looking for a study, it can also still be useful for um, being set up as a landing page. So if you're doing advertising somewhere else online, this is a place where you can redirect people where you could put more information about your study. As internet usage has increased in time, um, the types of activities that people are doing online has changed. In 2003, the most common online activity for older adults was checking email and information seeking. 
as the usage of social media has increased for everyone, it's also increased in older adults with 45% of older adults saying they use at least one social media site and that was as of earlier this year. Uh, our advertising has followed and gone in a similar trend where in the beginning when we were doing online advertising, we advertised on Yahoo or on our newspaper web page. And um, we typically advertised in the form of a pop-up window. So if someone was on Yahoo, they would get a pop-up describing our study and then they could click on it and get more information about the study. We later then moved into advertising on social media and more specifically on Facebook. With our most recent study, the weekend study, and that's the weekend I add that's on the left, we did get some interest um, and a lot of hits, but the yield was relatively low when we look at the number of people that actually enrolled in the study, it was less than 5%. However, uh, with our most recent study that we did, and it involved completing a survey questionnaire that had to be completed either online or via phone, the majority of those subjects that completed the study, and there were 200 in the study, the majority of them were recruited via Facebook. Similar to uh, using the electronic medical records, one good thing about Facebook is that you can also customize the delivery of your ads. So you can customize it to specific demographics, um, geographical areas, or even interests based on a person's profile. With Facebook ads, you pay a per impression cost, but it's also important to note that you can also share information through hospital, research, and community organizations. This was just a post that our CTSI did about the weekend study. So this is a free way to get information about your study out to a diverse group of people. Uh, as the network grows and more information is shared, the number of persons potentially seeing your ad will also increase. In the IDEA study, and the IDEA study was a diet and exercise intervention study in knee osteoarthritis, uh, we saw that 20% of those who were enrolled into the study were actually recruited by us going into the community and giving presentations to local civic, social, and religious groups. This method is low cost and in most cases free, but does take a lot of time and effort as your staff or investigators have to give their time to do their presentations. And in some instances, it involves establishing a rapport or a collaboration with the organization prior to gaining access to the group. When doing these types of recruitment, we present on the general topic of the research study. So in most cases, uh, the osteoarthritis studies, we talked about osteoarthritis in general, and then at the end, provide the specifics of the research studies that are recruiting. During the talk, we allow time for questions from the attendees, we engage with the audience, and we collect the contact information from those who are interested in hearing more about the study. Doing it this way is beneficial because everyone feels like they're getting something out of it. The attendees are able to receive useful information that might benefit them. Those who organized it feel that we're providing a service and not just using them to get research subjects. And it gives us an opportunity to make information about our study accessible to the wider community, um, even providing exposure to those who might not have had it other, otherwise. In addition to speaking to the organized groups, we've also recruited at community events like uh, health fairs, community night outs, and at farmers markets. To gain access to all these different community activities and organizations, we reach out to the organizations themselves, but we also ask our research participants to invite us to come and speak to any organizations that they are a part of. In addition to asking them to um, invite us to speak to the groups that they're a part of. We also ask them to spread the word to their family and friends. We have flyers and brochures available at all of our testing and intervention sites so that they may distribute them. And they also post information about our study on their personal social media pages. They may share posts that the study um, puts up or even post pictures of themselves within our research center. This just helps to further increase that distribution of um, the study news. Earlier, I mentioned using the electronic medical records to find providers in which to engage and use as a recruitment tool. 
We also have sent information about our study to physicians in our area and even to physicians that aren't in our health system, but they might have patients who have enrolled in our study. We ask the physicians on our study team to tell their patients and colleagues about the study. Uh, with the weekend study, one of our sites relied heavily on their physician network for the study referrals. For this to be successful, you have to establish a rapport with the practice or a specific physician. And it's typically best achieved by having a physician on your study team that already may be colleagues with some of them or that's in, within that hospital system. Getting the physicians on board may also trickle down to the clinic staff who may also have time with the patient and can also advocate for your study. And because mistrust of research is a huge barrier, having the physician who's someone that the participant may trust speak to them about the study, that might help to reduce or eliminate that. Study referrals have also played a large part in recruitment for us. We work with our Pepper Center at Wake Forest and within the Pepper Center, we have an established research core. Within this core, the network of studies funded by the Pepper Center or who have investigators that have worked with the Pepper Center in the past have a system in which we can provide study prefer, um, referrals. So each month, an updated list of available studies is sent out to all the study coordinators and it contains the enrollment information or basic enrollment information for each study. During the screening process, if a participant doesn't qualify for our study, we can then refer them to another study based on their eligibility criteria, the demographics or interests that the participant has. And other studies can do the same by providing their ineligible participants to us. Establishing a group like this has been really effective for us in terms of recruitment. Just to give an example, during the months of July and August of this year, there were a total of 260 referrals that were made to 11 studies within the core. So I would highly recommend setting up a research group like this within your departments. It's a cost effective way to keep those who contact the study engaged with the department, um, which could be useful for future studies and creates a rapport with this potential participant. That person calling in isn't just told they don't qualify for the study, but told that they may qualify for another trial which just gives them a positive experience during the screening process and may make them more likely to tell others about the study. So I know I've talked about a couple of different strategies. And so just to quickly summarize the various methods and to talk about considerations for each, you have the newspaper, which has a large reach, but you're unable to narrow that subject pool, which may be time consuming for the staff performing the screening because um, a lot of time gets spent speaking to those who may not be interested or who don't qualify for the trial. There are some avenues for free advertisements in the form of press releases, but in general, the ads are costly, especially if you follow that recommendation of running multiple weekly ads. And there is a trend, of course, showing the steady decline in print newspapers. For the IDEA study, which recruited between 2006 and 2008, though, it was our most effective recruitment method. And with our most recent trial, the WeCan study, it was one of the strategies that had the highest number of contacts in our more rural counties. So in Haywood County, uh, which is out west North Carolina, um, just west of Asheville, and then in Johnston County in eastern North Carolina. Radio and TV also have large reaches and access to the digital advertising, and there are avenues for free advertisements with them as well. They are also costly, and a potential participant has to see or hear the ad at that time in order to get the study information. With newsletters, you are able to narrow down your potential subject pool, such as with senior newsletters, but you will have a smaller reach in comparison to the newspaper or the radio. And after the initial cost of printing, postage, and production um, in the terms of like doing a mailing, using electronic medical records may be cost effective because it allows you to select persons who are more likely to qualify for your study. The cost of online advertising varies. There are venues where you can get free advertising, such as on an organization web page. But if you pay for ads, then you will have to pay a per impression cost. 
but you do have the ability to narrow your potential pool based on demographics, interests, and geographic location, depending on the venue you use, like such as on Facebook. With more people using and having smartphones and the usage of social media, though, online advertising is a viable option. One thing I didn't mention earlier um, that is starting to become a problem is because it's electronic, it is easier to get hacked um, by what are called bots. And that can interfere with recruitment efforts, such as entering in fake subject information, especially during like pre-screening, if you do that online. Um, that typically comes into play when incentives are being offered. Face-to-face -face advertising is relative free, relatively free, but does take a lot of time and effort. It also may be hard to gain access to the organization without having a member within that organization invite you. The use of referrals, um, whether that's with participants, physicians, or through a study referral is free. Establishing a rapport with the physicians in the area may be time consuming up front, but can pay off in the long run, especially if you have multiple trials. And persons are more willing to participate when a physician speaks to them about it or if someone they know is participating in the study. And establishing a recruitment core amongst studies is beneficial as well in recruiting participants. When we looked at physician participant and study referrals, they were within the top measures or top types of recruitment at all three of our sites for the weekend study, the third site being in Winston-Salem. So which one should you use? What's the best method to use? My answer would be more than one. It's important to use multiple strategies. There are pros and cons of using each one. And so you have to discover which combination works best for your study. What works for one study may not work for another. There's no real gold standard. Using multiple strategies also helps you to have a diverse subject pool. So just um, to go over a few like important considerations when designing the clinical trial and thinking about recruitment, um, it's important to know your audience. That will dictate the best strategies to use when recruiting. You need to ask, where does your audience spend their time? If you're recruiting older adults and decide to use online advertising, you'll, you'll, you'll wanna advertise on websites such as Facebook or Yahoo, not TikTok or Snapchat. If you're recruiting persons with osteoarthritis, targeting rheumatologist offices for recruiting would be an option. And although the use of print newspapers is decreasing, persons over 65 are five times more likely to purchase print newspapers. And so it is a viable source for recruitment, especially in rural areas. Once you've identified your audience and decided on which recruitment strategies you're gonna use, you need to design your ads that you capture their attention. People join studies for a variety of ways. Some join because there's gonna be a direct benefit for them or for their family, typically in terms of an illness or disease. Some join because of the incentives that are being offered. Others join to help their community or to be a part of something larger. So when designing your ads, all of that needs to be considered. In the headline, mentioning things such as, do you have knee pain? Would capture the attention of someone with osteoarthritis stating something like be a part of a research study on knee pain or be a pioneer for arthritis research appeals to those who want to volunteer. You want to keep your wording simple. For instance, in most of our ads, we just say knee pain rather than osteoarthritis. So if there's a way to simplify it, do it. You'll also want to use pictures that depict who you're trying to recruit. If it's a study on overweight older adults, you don't want to include pictures of college athletes. You'll also want to try to describe what is involved in the study and basic eligibility criteria. With your ads, you don't have much space, but you do want to try to give as best a description as you can, describing what tests may be involved, the intervention if there is one, the duration of the program, and who may or may not qualify. Doing this may potentially screen out those who have no interest or who wouldn't qualify for the study. And if you're advertising online, the use of a landing page can be used to further outline the details of your study. Um, that'll be effective in eliminating those who wouldn't qualify for the study, as well as give you a chance to pre-screen those um, prior to coming in for a visit. And of course, there are ethical considerations. You know, you don't want to say anything that isn't true, which 
with an IRB review would be denied anyway. You want to capture people's attention, but you don't want to be misleading or coercive. So I pulled a few ads just to kind of cover some of these points. So the good news is that none of these ads I found were from hospitals or universities, which is what I expected because an IRB review um, would have had to have been done on them typically anyway. So these are um, both the ones I'm showing are from private companies, but I thought they were still interesting to look at. Uh, this first one is one on knee pain and it has a catchy headline and it implies that if you go to this particular clinic, you're gonna get rid of your knee pain and you can do it without having surgery. If you follow the link, you see that they're doing this through the use of physical therapy. And as you keep reading, it talks about decreasing the knee pain, but not eliminating it. So they start off saying you'll get rid of it, but then later talk about just decreasing it. This next one is uh, really eye-catching. It's colorful, there's this slim model, on this slide and then there's pictures of actual people who have gone through the program or they say they've gone through the program. If you read the headline, it says that you'll get a new you um, with doing no shakes, no exercise and no prepackaged foods. So, I mean, who wouldn't wanna sign up for a weight loss program like that? And researching further, I found you have to commit to taking their drops on a daily basis but you also have to commit to a 500 calorie daily diet. So it's no surprise that their patients are reporting weight loss. So although we wouldn't go this drastic with doing any advertising like this and making false claims or being misleading, there are some lessons from these two ads just in the design with the catchy headlines and the imagery that's used. As I mentioned earlier, staffing is important and you do have to make sure you have that adequate staff and that they're given proper training to ensure the recruitment procedures are in line with the study. The recruitment staff will be the first, pers or the first person that a potential participant will be talking to. So you wanna make sure it's a positive one. If possible, have a recruitment team that will be responsible for all recruitment tasks. That may be designing the ads to make sure they're attractive, uh, making sure that they're placed in the appropriate locations and placed at the right times. And you wanna make sure you have an adequate number of ads. For our research studies, we design numerous ads at the beginning of the trial. We continue to redesign them during the trial and create new ads as well. With the We Can study with one of our sites, we had 38 different ads. So recruitment is a huge task and you have to stay on top of it. That recruitment team or the recruitment coordinator, they're gonna to need to meet um, regularly. They'll also need to monitor the metrics. So that may be looking at the number of calls and responses you receive. This uh, picture here depicts the number of calls we received at one of our sites in the We Can study. And we were able to look at this in real time at all of our sites. Just thinking back to that slide that I showed with the funnel where the number of people enrolled was dependent on the number that screen, you can kind of see that depicted here on the slide. That top line shows a number that was screened um, during these few months and then the bottom one, the number that ended up being eligible for the study. And you can see when there were peaks in the number that were screened, there were also peaks that were in the number that were eligible. You may also want to look at enrollment at multiple sites over the course of your study, as shown here um, in the WeCan study, where we looked at the what we called waves or groups in our study at all three of our sites over time. You can also look at where your calls are coming from based on referral source and even the response to specific ads that are released. Although the focus will be on those who are ultimately enrolled in the study, it is important to also pay attention to the responses and feedback that's received in the event you need to pivot to another recruitment method or if a particular barrier is being presented that might need to be adjusted. For instance, um, a number of potential participants mentioning having a time conflict, that's where you would need to look into potentially having an evening or a weekend time. <clears throat> It's important to develop a standardized recruitment process that outlines the recruitment strategies that will be used and when the procedures for calling participants back, including the number of times to call participants back and how to screen them. A tracking system should be developed that allows you to track potential participants in real time. 
that provides information on when they called in, if they've been called back, if so, when, how many times, and who did the calling. And this will allow the recruitment coordinator to assess whether participants are being called back within an appropriate time frame, um, just in case adjustments need to be made if necessary. You don't want to lose a person because you didn't call them back in time. You want to make sure you don't miss out on that enthusiasm that had them call in in the first place. It's also important to keep track of those who may not qualify at that time or who wanted to push their screening back for a later date. This uh, was a tracking system we used here where we just logged the participant information and then the date that they needed to be called back. So we would be flagged without us having to keep track of that. We would be flagged on when that person needed to be called back. You don't want people to fall through the cracks. And so having a system set up to keep up with that is gonna be helpful. And budgeting appropriately, of course, is gonna be important for every trial. You'll not only have to pay for your advertisements, depending on the strategy you use, but you also have the staff performing the recruitment and the time that's gonna be spent as well. It's important to review the cost of potential strategies that you may use during the planning phase so that you'll know what to expect during the trial. And just keep in mind that recruitment activities typically take about 30% of that project timeline. Um, you'll wanna include funds for unexpected activities, such as having a backup recruitment strategy in the event one of your strategies ends up failing, or in case the screening rate or the screen fail rate ends up being higher than expected and you have to recruit longer than you planned. Recruitment is the lifeblood of the study. Most trials fail due to failures within the recruitment process. So with successful planning and an outline of recruitment strategies and paying attention throughout the recruitment process, you can be better prepared to successfully recruit for your study. And this time I just wanna acknowledge the investigators and staff of the weekend study that I've worked with for the past six years. It was and has been the largest study that I've been able to be a part of. Uh, today, I learned a lot and it was definitely um, a good time working with that study and, and all of the people who collaborated on it. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Javita. That was really thorough and I know all the work you've put into this and uh, how things are going. To I'll um, just kind of open it up to see if anyone has any questions for you. And if not, I'm going to start. Oh, oh. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, Javita, that was a really great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the the planning uh, that goes into uh, like when you're uh, putting together the grant proposal. Uh, when it comes to the budget, because um, I'm thinking I've seen a number of grants over the years where people have not really planned for what some of the costs are related to recruitment. So if you could you know, tell me a little bit about some of that planning that goes on up front and how you justify to funders uh, the need for, for funds to, to cover the recruitment. Sure. And um, just real quick, Council, I can't get my video back on. It's saying that uh, I think the host has to turn it on. So just so you know. Sure, I'll, I'll do that. All right. Um, but yeah, so during the planning phase, uh, when we are, uh, you know, looking at our grant, we look at our previous studies and really focus on those that had similar demographics. So um, typically it's osteoarthritis studies that we're working with. So we look at how recruitment went for them and we look at the exclusion criteria. I can say for the WECAN study, it does look like our screening rate or that screen fail rate is going to be lower than our previous studies, but it was a pragmatic trial. So that, you know, is definitely a part of it. But we look at uh, the cost of the ads. We look at the number of subjects that are needed. And then we overplan as well, because we know that it's not always gonna turn out the way we expect. Uh, for example, we did a, it was a running trial, so it was in younger adults, but we ran a campaign that within two or three weeks, we were slammed with hundreds of calls that we ended up 
only spending, I think, about a quarter of our recruitment budget before we met our recruitment goal. So then the next study came along. We're like, oh, we can do this same type of recruitment. And then we didn't get any subjects and needed to recruit a whole lot longer than we planned. So there's always these unexpected things that come up. So I think definitely looking at your past data, looking at what's going on at the time. And even if you have time during a planning phase, doing a mock recruitment, which is what we've recently done with one of our trials will be helpful as well. Thank you. I was gonna ask if you'd talk a little bit uh, more about the mock recruitment, because I think that's been interesting and the whiteboard video and also the things that you learned with the Facebook about the the bots and how right. to stop that. Yeah, so um, what Lee is talking about, we have a current trial that we are planning for, that we are in the planning phase for right now. And so we did a mock recruitment where we recruited 200 people. It's in five areas across four in the US, one in Sydney, Australia, where we are planning on a, at this time, a four-year intervention. And so we wanted to get not only feedback from potential subjects that would be eligible for the study, it's all gonna be women, but uh, not only feedback on whether they would participate in a four-year intervention study, but also looking at methods of recruitment on how we're gonna be able to get these people. So we started off with Facebook and for completing a survey, people will get a $20 gift card to Amazon so that went up on Facebook and I'd say within two hours, we had the 40 responses that we needed at one site. And then the other, another site I think filled up their responses as well. And then we started looking through the data and reading these names and the emails that we got in. And after a while, you could see that these were names that didn't really make sense. The addresses looked weird. The phone numbers didn't make sense that we realized this did not seem to be real data. And so that's where we kind of discovered like we had been hacked by these bots. And basically it's these algorithms, you know, that are written that are typically looking for these incentives to get this $20 gift card. And they're just putting in, you know, this fake information. Luckily for us, it wasn't an automated program where you fill out the survey and then you get mailed in a $20 gift card. We did evaluate each person before we send in that $20 gift card to them. So we didn't send out any money, luckily, but it was a lot of time and effort to go through all of these survey responses. I think um, in Winston-Salem, we had over 600 uh, questionnaires that were sent in within the matter of hours, um, and all of those were fake responses. So you do have to be careful with Facebook, and typically these algorithms are written to look for incentives such as money or free um, gift cards and things like that. And so with the ads, we ended up running on Facebook. We pulled the money part out of it. We just talk about the, the study in general. And then when someone clicks on the ad and goes into it and goes to our landing page, that's where they see that there is a $20 incentive for filling out the survey. But to get to that point, typically it's gonna be an actual human that goes to that because they were interested in the study, not a bot trying to see um, you know, what this incentive is gonna be. So that's been our experience definitely with uh, the bots and, and using Facebook. But I would definitely continue to use Facebook. It's a quick and easy way to get things out there. And definitely one thing that's happened with this most recent study as well that didn't happen as much with We Can is once the ads were posted and someone saw it, they tagged their friend in the ad and then their friend tagged their friend in the ad. And so it just started multiplying and spreading across the area because more and more people were interested in this osteoarthritis study that was gonna be planned. Um, in some ways it was good because it spread all over the place, but then also it spread into places that we weren't doing the study. So I had people emailing in from Kansas asking if they could participate or if we had a site there, but it still got the information out of there because you never know who's going to see it, who's going to share it, and what their network is like. And, and that's really how companies use social media nowadays. You know, once they put it out there, as more and more people share it, more and more people find out about it. We tried that a little bit with WeCan, but it didn't take off as much as it has with 
top. And so I think with our next study, we'll try to focus on that a little bit more, whether that's putting special interest pieces that may not necessarily be about the study recruitment, but just something in general that someone may want to read. And then they keep frequenting our websites, that then they're sharing that information just to drive more people to our study website. I'm sorry I came on late, Javita, um, but thanks for giving the talk. That was fantastic. And um, Steve said it before, but all of his success in recruiting for trials has really been uh, you. So uh, it's it's fantastic that you've been involved in these studies. Um, and you may have said it at the beginning before I got on, but can you comment on working with the IRB in terms of approval of ads and things that you found that are sort of do's and don'ts of, of getting, you know, advertisements um, approved? Yeah. So um, first with uh, working with Dr. Messi, I have to say it's a team effort. So I cannot take credit for recruitment by ourselves. There's no way that we'd be able to recruit the subjects without having all hands on deck. And that's from the PI and our investigators going out to do the talks to our interventionists helping to screen people and even some of our graduate students jumping in to do phone screening, especially when we get hit with the big newspaper ads that have hit the paper and we get a lot of calls. But um, with the IRB, I think the biggest thing I've seen is they just want to make sure that you're not being too coercive when you're doing these ads. So even putting in things such as free tests and mentioning money and incentives, you have to be careful with because that is a motivating factor for a lot of people. And when we don't put that in, that's sometimes one of the first things people ask, well, what are you going to pay me for participating? And so you do have to be careful with that. One thing that our IRB, and it's kind of weird, they allow and don't allow is when we do the community advertising or going out to the community, they don't want us to pay our participants for referrals. So we can't say something like, you know, if you invite your friend and they make it through the screening process, we'll give you $25. But our IRB does allow if that same participant invites us to come and talk to their senior group at church, then we can give them a gift card. So there's a fine line between what you can do and what you can't do at the IRB. And so, I mean, the big thing we try to focus on is a possible benefits from the study, whether that's being in a diet and exercise program where you may see some benefits or even in our control group where we still provide valuable health education information, just highlighting those things and steering people away from the money or how this was going to help um, arthritis research in the future seems to get at most people. And our IRB has been okay with that. Thanks. And, and a follow up to that Have you found the IRB has sort of um, a limit into? the incentive you give, you know, for, for joining a study, like, you know, a hundred dollars, $200, there's, there's gotta be like a number where they think it's way too much. You're over incentivizing the money part. Um, do, do you have a feel for what that is these days? Yeah, not yet. We have not hit that limit. Um, and what we try to emphasize to our IRB is the long-term benefits of our study are going to outweigh even a $500 or $1,000 gift card. If someone's able to, I mean, most of our trials, as you know, are 18 months. So we're not just focused on, you know, a short-term period. We're trying to make a lifetime change with these people. And so those long-term benefits are going to outweigh, and we tell this to our participants too, it's going to outweigh the $500 gift card or the $1,000 gift card that you may see from a competing study, like through like a private company that, you know, we're really trying to change your life with these studies. And, and so that seems to satisfy the IRB as well as our participants. Do you um, want to comment a little bit about uh, input from the stakeholder board to some of the recruitment for the mock recruitment? Yes, that's been very helpful. So we are designing a trial that may be in uh, veterans with knee osteoarthritis. And so we presented the, uh, the plan of that to the stakeholder board there at UNC and the information we got from them was very valuable, even in thinking about potential other places to go and recruit within um, veteran uh, organizations and connections with that. And then just things that 
you know, things we may have missed and not thought about, but that someone that has osteoarthritis may think about all the time. Um, so that's been very helpful. We typically with our studies do have a community advisory board as well, which may be two to three people, um, persons with osteoarthritis as well as physicians as well. So we do talk to them regularly to get suggestions on recruitment on the materials that we may give out as well. So we try to cover all of our bases just to make sure there's not something that we're missing out on. And just to close things out, as you said, you and Steve uh, and the, your whole team are amazing. And, and we've learned a lot working with you, but just comment on all these studies. You've met all your recruitment goals and you've also, which will probably have you another time give a talk on retention, uh, but it, it just comment on your retention in all of these studies as yeah, well. So, uh, I mean, it's a, a full press effort. I mean, we've got a team that, you know, all the way from recruitment, like you said, to retention that's on top of everything and everyone works together. So we, you know, I mentioned we have a recruitment coordinator, but I mean, we've got this team and it's a team for everything. So the interventionist may be a part of the recruitment team. It may be, of course, a part of retention to keep those participants. And then our investigators are a part of that as well. I mean, the big thing I think we do is we meet regularly. So we have retention meetings almost every other week or adherence meetings. We have recruitment meetings every other week. And then we've got ways to track all of this because it is a lot of information. And, you know, when we were doing the idea study, which now started over 15 years ago, moving into the START study, and then we can, I think we just get better and better um, as time goes along and we have access to more digital avenues. So we're not having to use a paper form anymore to track screening and send or email over a participant's name to someone else. We've got a website where anyone can sign on at any time to see what's going on. So it takes a lot of stress off of our staff who have to keep up with that because it's right there on the computer for them and allows them time to focus on things like you said, like recruitment and retention of those subjects. Uh, so, I mean, I think also going with that, hiring the right people is, I mean, the, the most important thing. You know, you've got to have people who buy into this program itself. Because if they do, then they're going to make sure that the participants do. They're going to care about your study. And that's how we work. We have people who we can just back off and let them do their job because we know they know what they're doing. They care about what they're doing. And so that's definitely been like, you know, the biggest thing that's helped things out with the study and helped us to be successful with it. Well, thank you again. And I think councils uh, announced at the beginning, there'll be a little poll. Um, and we appreciate your talk so much. Thank you.